jumped all over a larva colored grub at about 11 feet deep, trolling at 1.4 miles an hour. This guy feels heavy. Hard to tell in this wind. I don't think I had that grub on there for maybe a minute or so and he was just all over it. Oh, this is a hefty fish with a bend in that rod. Oh gosh! Look at that! This is a nice fish. Jumped all over, all over that larva-colored grub. You know they they feed on a lot of insects at Davis, and uh, that grub's pretty good match. All messed up right now, but uh, that tiny little hook had him right in the tip of the nose. There's no way he was getting away. Awesome. Little grubs, big results, man. Uh, get this guy in the cooler and uh, get this grub back in the water. Have you ever been trout fishing in the high mountains? You know, you get out on the lake, you immediately start catching fish, they're jumping all over your spoons or plugs or whatever you're pulling. And then all of a sudden, aquatic insects start coming off and you can't get hit anymore. Congratulations, you've just been introduced to what we call selective trout. And uh, the fly fishermen out there, they know exactly what I'm talking about. When trout, you know, that when they're confronted with an abundant food source, whether it be, you know, flying ants or hatching mayflies or whatever it is, They'll get dialed in on that food source, they'll get tunnel vision, and catching them on anything else can be extremely challenging. And uh, that's exactly what I was experiencing up at Lake Davis last fall when I caught that rainbow you saw in the beginning of this video. The fish was about three pounds. It was a really nice fish, but it came after probably two hours of frustration when I wasn't catching anything. I caught that fish on a little tiny larva colored grub, just like that. But uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the day in general before we get to the get to the grub and get to how I started catching fish again. Um, hit the water early, just like I described. I started nailing fish on spoons and big trolling flies. Man, I was doing great. I probably had 20 fish that morning. And all of a sudden, bugs started coming off and I couldn't get hit anymore. And I was thinking about slowing down at that point and putting on some smaller offerings but then the wind came up and I thought, well, I, I got chopped now. I don't need to slow down because when I get choppy conditions, I've talked about it on the channel here a ton. When I get choppy conditions, I get even more aggressive. I troll faster and uh, I start triggering those fish. Typically rainbows, they're gonna pull up into that chop. There's oxygen there, there's current there and they feel safe under that chop. Well, I started power trolling again and uh, I was not hooking anything. And I thought to myself, well, Okay, they're still feeding on in insects. I can't see them feeding on the insects. I can't see them swirling on the surface because of all this chop, but they must still be feeding on those aquatics. So I rigged up with the little larva colored grub. I started trolling at about one mile an hour going into the wind, and I don't think it took 30 seconds to hook the first fish. And I got another probably half dozen fish or so before I had to pull off because it just got so rough out there. And uh, that bite probably went on, well, went on for as long as those aquatics were hatching. So I could have kept on catching fish on small grubs, stuff like that. But uh, ultimately, I had to go home, one, and two, it, was, it wasn't, uh, wasn't real safe out there. I had some pretty big rollers, some pretty big white caps, and uh, I chickened out and I went back to the ramp. So the question is, when you're out on a lake and they start, you know, the trout start feeding on aquatics, they get that tunnel vision and your bite shuts down, what can you do to reinvigorate the bite? Particularly, particularly, <laughs> can't even talk, if you want to continue trolling. Now, anytime that happens, you could stop trolling, bust out a slip bobber and a worm, and you're probably going to catch fish because they just have a hard time laying off a worm when you put it right in their face. But the bait fishing is not for everybody. If you want to keep on trolling, what can you do to catch fish when they're feeding on aquatics? And typically, that means downsizing, slowing down, and going with some buggy, 
or natural type presentations. Now, when I was at Davis, as I showed you, I reached for one of my small larva colored grubs. Now, if I was at a, at a more clear water lake, I probably would have went with the same size grub, but I would have went with a clear one. Very subtle. Bottom line is, subtle. I put the grub on with no blades, no flashers, no nothing. I put it about five feet under the surface and I trolled forward into that wind just fast enough to make the tail on that grub work. And that trout, he was up there, he was looking for nymphs, he saw something natural going very slow and jumped all over it. Now, other offerings that I found to work in that situation, and there's really kind of just three for me, um, one, are the soft plastics, the grubs, stuff like that. Number two are small flies, and a couple in particular. Small woolly boogers in natural colors like that. I might fish these with a wiggle disc, but more than likely, I'm gonna troll them at one mile an hour or less, and I'm gonna troll them with no attractor and no action whatsoever. I'm just gonna rely on that hackle and that marabou tail to create the action and draw the strikes. Um, another fly that I've, I found to work very well in that situation is even subtler than a woolly booger. It's a straight up woolly worm. A woolly worm is basically a woolly booger without the marabou tail. And again, no blades, no flashers, no discs, no nothing. Just move that through the water at one mile an hour or less and you will probably start getting hit again. And uh, finally, either a threaded night crawler or a threaded gulp worm and you don't want to go big. If I was going to use a gulp worm like this, I would cut that piece of worm down to about three quarters of an inch to maybe an inch max. The key is going slow, going small, and getting as close to those, those insects that the fish are eating as you possibly can. Um, kind of final thought on this. Brian Ricucci, Big Daddy's Guide Service, master troller. He fishes at Lake Almanor. I distinctly remember this. And you know, whenever I go trout fishing, I've been doing it forever, but whenever I go trout fishing, I try to learn something. And this is triply true when I go out with a master guide like Brian Ricucci. So we're up at Almanor. It's early June. And uh, we go to this big flat. And it's, it's fairly deep. It's like 30 feet deep. And uh, you know, we're looking at the sonar unit and there are arches everywhere down there. There are obviously some really big trout down there. And uh, Brian gets out a worm threader and he rigs up a piece of worm about that big. That's it. No blades, no dodgers, no nothing. Little piece of worm that big. He drops it down there within about three feet of the bottom. And uh, that's what we start trolling. So I'm talking to him. I'm like, what's the deal, Brian? He said, well, they're the, the big old giant, um, I forget what they're called, the, the hexagenia, hexagenia mayflies are in Elmanor. And bottom line is the larva, the nymphs, they live down in the mud on those, on those, you know, 25 to 30 foot deep flats. And when they get ready to hatch, they got to swim up to the surface. And uh, Brian, we're looking at all these arches on the screen and Brian's all, yeah, how would you like to be a bug, you know, back, backstroking through all those marks to get to the surface? And I was like, ooh, that doesn't sound like much fun. Um, but we started catching fish on the worms and I'm like, what's the deal with that? You're not really matching the insects. He said, no, I'm not matching the insects at all. He said, but I am matching the size of the insects. And he says, bottom line is, for the number of trout here, I'm not getting hit very much. But he said, I'm fooling enough of these trout to have a very good outing. And uh, you know, a lot of these trout are big. So he wasn't exactly matching the nymphs. In fact, he wasn't even close to matching the nymphs. But what he was doing was he was, he was tricking some percentage of those fish around. And that's exactly what I was doing with my little grub. I was trolling near the surface, but those fish were feeding on some, some sort of mayfly and uh, by trolling this grub slowly past them, even though it was bigger than what they were actually eating, I was able to draw some strikes. Now, when I was trolling spoons and big flies, I wasn't able to draw any strikes. So it wasn't, it wasn't a wide open bite, but it did, it did allow me to catch several more fish before I had to call it a day. 
anyway, it's just a thought on how you deal with an insect hatch up in the high mountains when it occurs and kind of shuts your bite down before you're ready to go in, it can be a day saver. And it's little things like that, that, that just add to your, you know, your total of fish throughout the season. And as you saw at the beginning of this video, sometimes you can trigger strikes from very large, very nice trout by doing something subtle, by downsizing when you're, you know, when, you know, when you're faced with challenging conditions. So anyway, just my thoughts, guys. If you're looking for grubs, check out my store. I've got a full selection of grubs and my grub kits in there and stuff like that, plus a bunch of other tackle. Um, I wanna thank you guys for all the support you've given the channel, all the love you've given to us. Please hit that subscribe button if you haven't had a chance to do that. And if you'd like a notification when I put up a new video, hit that little bell symbol down there. Anyway, I'm Kel Kellogg, I'm signing off. You have a great day and I will catch you next time right here on YouTube.